Okay, turn with me, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. And as you're turning there, I'm going to ask for a little bit of audience participation. So listen very closely, because this is a little bit unusual. Now, for everybody in this congregation who has not held a position, an official position in the church, like board of management or trustee, for those who have not been a deacon, those who have not been a trustee, those who have not been an elder, and I'm not trying to embarrass or point anybody out, I do have a point to this. So if you have not had an official position as an elder or a leader in this church, I would like you to stand. Now it says in Leviticus 19.32, you are to rise in the presence of the elderly and honor the old. Fear your God, I am the Lord. Everyone who is standing has not held an official eldership leader type position in the church. And that's no slight or shame on anybody. The reason I wanted us to stand is so that we could recognize the ones that are sitting who have held positions in our church as an elder, as a deacon, as board of management, or as trustees, because they are the elders of our church, and they deserve a round of applause for everything they've done for our church in the past. You may be seated. Again, that was not to embarrass anybody or to, to point anybody out, but I think it's very appropriate that we recognize our elders the leaders in our church, the leaders in our congregation, because they do more behind the scenes. You know, it's, it's like a rock band, right? The lead singer is called the front man because it's the lead singer that gets all the attention because he's the one who's wearing the crazy clothes and has the microphone and all the girls are swooning over him. Woo! And it's the real, the real people who make the band is the bass player, the drummer who keeps time, and the guitar player, but they don't get as much recognition because they're standing in the background playing the music while the lead singer belts out the lyrics. He gets most of the attention. And when they do news interviews, it's usually the lead singer that is interviewed. They don't care about the drummer. He's just sitting back way in the back somewhere. You know, the guitar player, the bass player, no, you know, they want the lead singer. So sometimes I'm like the front man in the band of this church. I'm the one who's most visible. I'm the one who's always gabbing and talking, but I'm not the most important guy here. The most important people that are here is sitting among you in this auditorium because they are the ones day in and day out, years before I even came along, and will probably be here years after I leave if the Lord tarries. They are the ones who keep this church running. They're the ones who do all the behind the scenes stuff that you don't think about. You know, it's not some magical fairy that comes in and decorates the church. It's not some fairy who travels back into the gymnasium and sets up all the tables for our potlucks. You know, it's a lot of times it's the unsung heroes of our church. It's the elders of our church who pull together and do these things. When something's broken, alakazam, poof, it's fixed the next week. We don't have a fairy that comes in and fix, fixes our like broken rails and our broken lights. It's the trustees that come in when the church is quiet, when nobody's here, when nobody sees them. And they break out the tools and the ladders and they fix the things. So when we come in the next week, it's, everything's fine. So these are the people that, that have kept this church alive and kept this church going. And over the past couple of weeks, I've been looking into the history of uh, Plaster Rock United Baptist Church. I felt it incumbent upon me, if I'm going to be a good leader, I don't want to make the same mistakes that other leaders may have made in the past. Those who do not study the past are doomed to repeat it. So I wanted to learn about this church, how it got started, where it came from, and I wanted to know who the pastors were and what their successes were and the different changes and, and great things and events that have happened in this church. And you know what? There's, there's been 30 some odd ministers that have come and went throughout the over 100 years that this church has been in existence. Pastors, ministers, they come and go. But guess who has stayed, tried and true, day in and day out? It's been the elders. It's been the board of management. It's been the trustees. It's been the Sunday school teachers, the nursery workers, the janitors. 
It's been those people who have kept this church going and kept the lights on. And even when the pastor felt led to go somewhere else, and maybe this church was out with, was without a pastor for a period of time, they're the ones who come together and pitched in and, and kept church going, kept it happening. So they deserve a lot of honor and a lot of credit. As Leviticus 19.32 says, You are to rise in the presence of the elderly and honor the old. Fear your God. I am the Lord. Now, church can maybe um, can, can be a little bit like a hockey team. So the, 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 the members of the church are the players. Now, there's somebody who owns a hockey team. And it's very rare that the owner sells the hockey team to somebody else. They are the owners, and they're the owners pretty much for life. It's the owners of the hockey team that's always there. Players may come and go. Some players are there from the very start, and they'll be there till the very end or until they retire. But guess who's that one person that comes in and out all the time? Can anybody tell me? It's the coach. You won't always have the same coach. You know, the coaches come and go. Now, there is a team, maybe you guys, I'm not good at hockey. I'm not, you know, a hockey connoisseur. I don't have a favorite team per se. But there is a recent team that was on a losing streak until they changed coaches. Am I right? Who would that be? Toronto. The Toronto Maple Leafs. They were in a slump. They were on a losing streak, and they're like, man, it's the coach's fault. Let's get rid of this coach. And a new coach comes in, and, you know, boom, things start thriving. They start winning games. See, the minister, the pastor, is kind of like a coach. He comes and goes. He's only there for a specific amount of time, however long, however long God wants him there, to accomplish some purpose, to accomplish some mission, and then God calls him elsewhere. And when that pastor leaves the church, just like a coach leaves, leaves a hockey team, the owner's still going to be there. The players are still going to be there. That hockey team still has to keep running somehow. And it's the owner that keeps the hockey team going. And it's the elders of the church that keep the church going when you guys are in between ministers and in between pastors. So I think that the elders, they are the unsung heroes of this church. Now, we just read... Leviticus chapter 19 talking about the old and the, the elderly and the gray haired and how that they are to be honored and respected, how they're to stand, how we are to stand in their presence. You know, maybe that's where that custom came, which we've lost in our society, but that when an elder comes in, we're supposed to rise up before them, greet them and offer them our seat. Because they're older, they've been down the pike further than we have. They deserve honor and respect because of their age and the wisdom and knowledge and the experience that comes with age. Now, it's interesting. We know that God is a spirit, right? So God is a spirit. He has no corporeal form. But sometimes when God communicates with human beings, he takes on a physical form. You know, Jesus Christ himself, he's God. He's God in the flesh. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that's the Word is Jesus Christ. He came down from heaven, robed himself in flesh, became a man, right? So sometimes when God interacts with us, he takes on some sort of tangible physical appearance or form. Now in Daniel 7.9 and in Revelation 1.8, it talks about the Ancient of Days. It gives a physical description of this spiritual God. And guess the way it describes God. He has white hair. It describes him as old, ancient of days, white hair. It, represents, it shows God as elderly, as being a father, as having knowledge, experience, wisdom, therefore deserving of honor and deserving of respect. And he took on this form in Daniel and Revelation to teach us that we are to love and to respect and honor our elders who go before us. Have you ever thought about your life? Not, you know, let's, I mean, we can take it from, from country to church to family. Canada was built on the backs of our ancestors, of our elders that fought for our freedoms and fought for this land. And set up this land to have a, a, a blessed life. And we think of this church. It's over 100 years old. 
This church is built by the blood, sweat, and tears on the back of the elders that have went before us. We can walk through this entire facility and see plaques here and there honoring somebody because they were a man of God, a woman of God, a man of prayer, because they were a deacon, because they were an elder. And this pew is, is in honor of this person, and this communion set is in honor of this person. This youth loft is in honor of this person. Why? Because this church was built on the backs of the elders. It wasn't built on the back of me. It wasn't built on the back of any of the pastors that have been through here. We're just the coaches to encourage you, to teach you, to train you, to edify you, to spur you along. But it's the elders that stay behind and do the work behind the scenes. And we think of our families. It's always interesting when you get into genealogy to find out who you are and where you come from. And once you discover about these ancestors that you never knew about, we may know up to our grandfather, maybe even great grandfather. After that, we kind of lose it. But if we find this stuff out, we think, wow, you know, perhaps your ancestors came over from Ireland during the potato famine. Maybe they came after, you know, the Nazi regime and they escaped the Nazi regime to come here for a better life. Or who knows? But you're here because of elders, older people, gray haired people, people that should be loved and respected and honored and their memory should be kept alive. And it's interesting how God portrays himself as the ancient of days, as an elderly person, as an elderly image with gray white hair, because that's a lesson to us. And you read throughout the scriptures how the elders were treated when Jacob finally came to Egypt to see Joseph, his long lost son. It wasn't Jacob that bowed down to Joseph because Joseph was second in command of Egypt. It was Joseph who bowed down to his father. Because he honored his father. And if you read a lot of these accounts, the patriarchs were buried like kings. When Jacob died, it said that the Egyptians mourned for him and he was buried like a pharaoh. He was embalmed just like a pharaoh would have been embalmed. And it just goes to show the love and respect of the elders that we need to have. And you know, I, I think of my family. I think of my father. He's been gone over a decade. Oh my goodness, I wish I could be half the man he was. He wasn't perfect by far. He had his faults, no doubt. But oh, he's a man of God and he loved people. My mom, she says, I'm half the person I am without him. A lot of you widows could probably relate to that. My mother says, literally, your father was my knight in shining armor. If it wasn't for my father, I probably wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. And I think of my uncles who fought in the wars. And I, I'm, the three uncles that I remember, or my two uncles I remember the most is Uncle James and Uncle Eugene and, of course, my father. They were like the three musketeers. They were the godliest men in our family. And I just, oh, I wish I could just be half the men that they were. If there's any evidence against evolution, it's like, you know, carbon copies. You remember back before the copier machine, you had those purple copy, the, the carbon paper, and everything would come out looking purple? Huh? Yeah. And the more you copied, the less bright, the less brilliant, the more faded it would become. And the more copies you make, the poorer the image. And we can see the same thing with a photocopy machine, a Xerox machine. The more images you make, the, the less good it looks. There's a degradation. And it's kind of like generations. I just wish I could be half the man that my father was. But there's something called entropy, something called the second law of thermodynamics, where things don't get better and better and better and better. Things just degrade and get worse and worse and worse. Things wind down. Things wear down. So there's no such thing as evolution, a macro evolution. Things don't get better. The, the, the brand new car that many of you have bought is not going to get better. It's going to wear and tear and get worse and worse and worse. You're going to have to replace parts, and eventually it's going to end up in the junkyard. Things don't get better, they get worse. So we kind of see how generation, one generation is not as bright, not as strong, not as holy as the last generation that went before it. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 12. This is, this is when things went south. For Israel, when Israel was divided, and it, it was all because one young king did not listen to his elders. 
One young king thought he was brighter and smarter than the rest of them. So 1 Kings chapter 12, beginning of verse 1, it says, Then Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard about it, he stayed in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon's presence. Jeroboam stayed in Egypt, but they summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, which Rehoboam was Solomon's son, right? After Solomon died, then Rehoboam uh, stepped up to be king. Verse 4, your father made our yoke harsh. You therefore lighten your father's harsh service and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam replied, go away for three days and then return to me. So the people left. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon when he was alive. See, even Israel, they had one king after another, one king after another. But who stayed when the kings came and went? It was the advisors. It was the elders. They never went anywhere. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon when he was alive, asking, How do you advise me to respond to these people? They, the elders, the wise, the experienced, they replied, Today, if you will be a servant to this people and serve them, and if you will respond to them by speaking kind words to them, they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice of the elders who had advised him and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him. Basically his peers, his classmates, his school group. Verse 9, he asked them, what message do you advise that we send back to the people who said to me, lighten our yoke that your father put on us? Then the young men said, uh, that had grown up with him and told him, this is what you should say to the people who said to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. This is what you should tell them. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Although my father burdened you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. I'll discipline you with barbed whips. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had ordered. Return to me on the third day. Then the king answered the people harshly. He rejected the advice of the elders had given him and spoke to them according to the young men's advice. My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. I'll discipline you with barbed whips. The king did not listen to the people because this turn, this turn of events came from the Lord to carry out his word, which the Lord had spoken through Ahiah the Shalonite to Jeroboam son of Nebat. When all Israel saw that the king had not listened to them, the people answered to them, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Israel, return to your tents. David, now look to your own house. So Israel went to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the Israelites living in the city of Judah. Wow, that's pretty telling. You hear, you hear you have Solomon's dead. He, had the, he brought in the golden age of Israel. There's no kingdom that has ever been like Solomon's and will never will be until Messiah returns. And he takes the throne. So his son Rehoboam takes his place. And so he asked the elders, what do I do? He's like, hey, tell them that you love them. Tell them that you're going to make it easier on them. Tell them that you want the best for them. I mean, the elders knew they were trying to give great, solid advice so that Rehoboam would have a, a solid kingdom. But no, he listened to his peers. The ones that were the same age, the ones that were just like him. And they said, no, these guys are just whiny little brats. You're the king. You can do whatever you want. Tell me you're going to make it harder on them for being so whiny. That didn't work out. Would you submit to yourself to a king that says it's going to make things harder on you? No, you'd do the same thing that Israel did. Israel, go to your tents. We don't have anything to do with David or his kingdom. So the kingdom was divided and split. Now the elders had the advice to keep the kingdom together. But the young Rehoboam wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen to the wise advice of the elders. Now that's not to say that Rehoboam would have to listen and do every single thing that the elders said. 
But that was solid advice that he gave. And he just snubbed it. And as a result, we have a divided kingdom. And it's been divided ever since. Guess what? There's 12 tribes of Israel, but only Levi and Judah we recognize today. They live all over the world. They live in Israel. But the other 10 tribes, the house of Israel, where are they? They've been lost to Assyrian captivity and never returned, assimilated into the people groups around the world. So there's people that are Hebrews and Israelites that are walking in this earth that don't even know it because they've been lost. Now turn with me, if you will, to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, we're going to start at chapter 3 and verse 5. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 5. Then we're going to jump to chapter 4 really quick. So we know that Nehemiah was going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that have been broken down and have been torn down. He was going to try to, to bring Israel back together after you know, the, the captivity. So Nehemiah 3, 5 says, Besides the Kohites made repairs, but the nobles did not lift a finger to help their superior or their supervisors. So did you get that? So Nehemiah is looking for volunteers. Nehemiah is looking for people to help build the wall. The everyday common Joe says, yeah, we'll do it. Sure. But it says that the nobles did not lift a finger to help their supervisors. No, no, we will not lift our finger to help you because we're the elders and we are royalty and nobility. And it's below us to get dirt under our fingernails. So we'll get the uh, commoners to do the work for us. <laughs> so these elders thought, you know, they thought work was below them. These were not good elders. These were not good nobles because they refused to help the common man. Right? These are not the kind of elders that you want in your church. These are not the kind of elders that you want in your congregation. And praise God, bless God, these are not the elders that we have. Because I'm telling you, our elders are 60 and above. And no, none of them have refused me yet when I ask them to do something. No matter how old they are, no matter what they got going on, they're willing to serve. They're willing to help. They're willing to pitch in. And I praise the Lord for that. So we have some elders and some nobles that didn't step up to the plate. But that's not the end of the story. You turn to chapter 4, starting with verse 15. When our enemies heard that we knew their scheme and that God had frustrated it, every one of us returned to his work, returned to his own work on the wall. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half held spears, shields, and bows and armor. The officers supported all the people of Judah who were rebuilding, who were rebuilding the wall. The laborers who carried the loads worked with one hand and held weapons in the other. Each of the builders had his sword strapped around his waist while he was building, and the trumpeter was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is enormous and spread out, and we are separated far from one another along the wall. Wherever you hear, whenever you hear the trumpet sound, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work while half of the men were holding spears from daybreak until the stars came out. And that time, I also said to the people, let every one of his servants spend the night inside Jerusalem so that they can stand guard by night and work by day. And I, my brothers, my servants, and the men of the guard with me never took our clothes off. Each carried his weapon, even when washing. So we hear, so we see that opposed from chapter 3, verse 5, from chapter 4, verse 15 on, you had some elders who thought they were better than everybody else, that it was below them to get their hands dirty and do work of commoners. But then in chapter 4, you see that there were some elders that said, forget this. Our lives, our existence, our city, the reputation of our God is at stake. We've got to build this wall. If we don't do it, nobody will. And the elders, along with the commoners, stood beside 
side by side, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, with a weapon in one hand and a trowel in the other, building the wall of Jerusalem. The elders pitched in. They led by example. It wasn't below them to do the work. So we see in Nehemiah that there are some elders that stepped up to the plate. And I will tell you right here, right now, every elder that was left remained in their seat when everybody else stood. They have stepped up to the plate for our church. They have done the dirty, gritty work behind the scenes. They've cried tears you've never known that they've cried. They've gone through battles and tribulations and trials and problems that you'll never know of because they won't complain. They won't air their dirty laundry on Facebook. They suffer quietly. They suffer in silence. Why? Because they love you. Because they want to see this church survive. No matter who's behind this pulpit, they want to see this church continue on. And they're going to be here long after I'm gone. There's a story about a Japanese soldier of World War II. We know that World War II ended May 8th, 1945. But yet the last Japanese World War II soldier did not surrender until guess what year? 1974. The war ended in 1945, but this Japanese soldier was serving, like, I think, uh, in the Philippines somewhere, in the jungles. He didn't get the memo. Nobody told him that the war was over. And he stayed at his post from 1945 to 1974. He never left his post. He never abandoned his comrades. He never ab abandoned his duties and responsibilities as a soldier. People would come along and say, hey, the war is over. Nope, not going to believe it. You're not going to trick me. You're not going to fool me. It took, he would not step down until the mayor gave him an official documented record and came to him and said, look, yes, it's true. The war is over. You can leave your post. Could you imagine standing sentinel, lonely guard from 1945 to 1974 without a word from your army, without a word from your officials, without a word from your country? Yet he didn't say, well, nobody's come to check on me, so I'm just going to kick back and do what I want. He still stood guard. He still did not abandon his post. And he remained a soldier in the Japanese army, thinking that the war was still on and served faithfully until an official came and said, hey, the war is over. And guess what? It's 1974. Wow, what dedication. Wow, what resoluteness. And I say the elders of our church are the exact same way. They have not backed down. They have not given up. And they deserve our applause. They deserve our backpacks. They deserve our thanks and praise because that's the reason we're still here. That's the reason that we still have a church. We're in the Lord's army. And the elders, by their life and service, have proven that they won't stand down until called home. By the Lord God of Israel, the commander in chief, just as this Japanese soldier didn't step down until he got an official word from one of the Japanese mayors. The elders in our church, I guarantee you, will not step down until they get called home to the Lord when the Lord says, your service is over. Because you don't retire from God's, God's army. Right? Your retirement is when you get six feet in the ground or when the Lord comes back, whichever comes first. If we, as a congregation, could only be half the men and women that the elders that have gone before us are. And I just want to thank God for those in our congregation who works behind the scenes tirelessly, no matter how old they are, no matter how much they got on their plate, no matter how much they got going on. And I, I value their input and I value their advice. And one of the first things that I did when I officially became the pastor of this church is I gathered Dennis, Lynn, and Ron back in that kitchen. I said, guys, I can't do this on my own. I don't want to do this on my own. I want you guys to know that we're a team. And I want you to know I'm depending on you. And I want your blessing to do this. I want you to lay hands on me and anoint me in the name of the Lord. Because I can't do this alone. I can't do this without you. And I refuse if you're not going to lay hands on me and pray over me. 
The the success of the church is not necessarily on my shoulders. My elders are carrying the brunt of that burden with me. They are standing side by side with me carrying that burden. And I thank the Lord so much that they laid their hands. It meant so much to me that they laid their hands on me and prayed for me. Because I want God's will to be done in this church. I want God's will to be done in this congregation. I want to see revival happen. I want to see this church filled, not so we could brag and say we got a bunch of numbers, but each person that sits in here represents a soul, a life, a hurt, habit, or hang up. It represents a salvation. It represents a deliverance. It represents a change in Plaster Rock. We can tell that Plaster Rock is going to change when we can see these church pews filled. Not just our church, but Grace, Freewell Baptist, and Sisson Ridge. And the other churches, when those pews get filled, not just ours, but when those get filled, we know that there's a move going on in Plaster Rock. And we've got a great history. We've got a great history. I read, and there was no numbers to these statistics, but we had at one time the largest baptism that ever happened in Plaster Rock. Happened with our church. In the 1980s, We built and dedicated a whole new wing to our church, dedicated to Christian education, which now stands abandoned and empty. And it's just itching and waiting to be filled with kids, with young people. I'm not getting discouraged. I'm not getting down. I don't think it's hopeless. Because I told you once, and I will tell you again, I'm not called here to be a palliative pastor. I'm not here to hold your hand and pat your hand while you guys die and drift off into eternity and say, oh, it's okay. God is with us. No, I'm here with the paddles. And I'm going to put those paddles to your chest and zap you back to life with the God's help. Because I'm not a palliative pastor. He didn't call me to pastor a dying church. He called me to pastor a living church, a thriving church. What, what's our saying? Uh, a church that's alive and is worth the drive? Boy, we've got a big reputation to live up to. We don't want to be accused of false advertisement, do we? A church that is alive and worth the drive, is it really? It's up to us to make it that way. Yeah. I want to live up to our moniker. I want to live up to our name. And again, not for bragging rights or anything like that, but just to see souls saved. To see this... Oh, we are on a mission field that's on the brink of hell. I don't want to be anywhere else. I can't think of a better mission field to be than Plaster Rock, New Brunswick right now. This village is going to hell in a handbasket and we're right there at the edge of hell. and say, hey, come on. You don't have to go off the cliff. You don't have to go to hell. We're here. We've got the answers. There's safety in here. And with God's help, we're going to do it. With God's help, every single one of you is going to be involved in this. And it starts with prayer. We just witnessed a magnificent magnificent miracle to prayer this week. Like I said, we could have had a funeral today for Ashley Smith. Man of God, God rest his soul. But no, he's sitting here right now because we prayed for his safety. And being broken down in the woods all night in the dead of winter. And he made it home safe and sound. And he's sitting here today because of our prayers. Because of God's faithfulness. Prayer works. And if we pray for our church. And if we pray for revival. And we pray for our lost loved ones. Our lost husbands. Our lost children. Our lost grandchildren. Our lost neighbors. Things are going to happen. And if we get bold enough. To say, look, I got a solution to your drug problem. I got a solution to your relationship problem. I got a solution to your depression. I got a solution to your fear. Come with me. I have the answers. Look what God has done for me. He can do the same for you. You are the mission team. And outside these doors are the mission field. And we can do it because we've got a solid foundation that has been built on the blood, sweat, and tears and backs of the elders of today and of the past. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Yes, sir. That's right. Praise the Lord for the wardens and the RCMP. Uh huh. And they went 
extra shop back on the road. And uh, a lot of the ones, some of your uh, husbands and wives uh, were part of that, that brought us back on that road. And uh, we uh, worked as a team after we got back on the road, our vehicle and the other five, to get them back on the road, to the main road that was flattered. Our road was the flat. Wow. We were on. Amen. Yeah. First responders, our RCMP, our wardens, our EMTs, they deserve credit and thanks for the hard work they do. And so praise the Lord for all the people that were involved to help bring Ashley safe home. There were boots on the ground, the wardens, the RCMP, but you guys were just as important in the rescue as anybody else because you prayed. And the prayer, it says in James, the prayer of a righteous person availeth much. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you so much for our men and women, the elders of our church, present and past, who have worked hard and tirelessly and who have endured persecution and who has who's endured ridicule and, and criticism and has gone through hell and high water, thick and thin, fair weather and foul weather. They've gone through the storms of this church and they're still here. I'm not guaranteed to be here. I'm going to come and go. I'm just the coach. But these elders, they're rooted and uh, firmly grounded in this place. And they're the ones who deserve the back pats and the praise and accolades because they are your tireless servants who's been working at the wall to build up the wall of safety for this church with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. And we want to thank you, Lord, for the elders that you've placed in this congregation, godly men and godly women who have sacrificed their lives, body, soul, and spirit, who spent sleepless nights, who's prayed, who served faithfully. And we thank you. We thank you that they're a part of our church. We thank you that, that they're here and that you've blessed us with them. Continue to bless them with health and with strength. And I pray, Lord, above all, that you would just send other people that, would, that they could take under their wing, that could be trained up, so that they, when they pass on the baton as elders, that they're ensured that there's somebody that's, that's waiting in the wings, that's gonna take their place, that's gonna do a stand up, bang up job to continue the legacy of the elders of this church. And Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. The Plaster Rock United Baptist Church. Come join us every Sunday morning at 11 a.m.